Hello everyone, and welcome back to a new episode of Advent of Code 2016. Uh, today we're going to be doing an analysis of my solution to problem 20. Uh, mm, it was pretty short, so maybe we'll get into problem 21 in this episode as well. I don't know. Depends on how, uh, how much I like to talk. So uh, let's read over the problem description, and then I'll, uh, I'll show you what I came up with. Day 20, firewall rules. You'd like to set up a small hidden computer here so you can use it to get back into the network later. However, the corporate firewall only allows communication with certain external IP addresses. You've retrieved the list of blocked IPs from the firewall, but the list seems to be messy and poorly maintained, and it's not clear which IPs are allowed. Also, rather than being written in dot decimal notation, they are written as plain 32-bit integers, which can have any value from 0 through, like, a, there's a big number, inclusive. For example, suppose only values 0 through 9 were valid, and that you retrieved the following blacklist. So there's, each of these ranges is inclusive, so any IP between 5, 6, 7, and 8 are all not allowed, neither are 0, 1, or 2, uh, and 4 through 7 doesn't really tell us anything new, oh, well, it tells us 4 isn't allowed. So only allowed are 3 and 9. <clears throat> okay, uh, so great. Then the question is, what is the lowest valued IP address that, that is not blocked? So uh, let's, let's look at what I wrote. Uh, actually, you know what? Not yet. No peeking. Um, I want to talk first about a solution that I didn't write, uh, that I wanted to write, and then uh, that I spent some time sort of... Uh, focused on and thinking about, uh, which is, so this is, this problem is sort of more commonly phrased as um, like a, a scheduling algorithm for, say, a, uh, an operating system kernel or whatever. Um, is that, am I thinking of a, of a different thing? I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's maybe that's the wrong thing, but like another way you can see it is like okay, let's say you have a calendar, and like on your calendar are events that have a start time and an end time, and you want to find times when you're not busy, right? That's the same thing. We have a range from A to B that are marked as like being of some type, and we have a bunch of such ranges, and we want to find elements that are not in that range. Um, and so I've. I, the previous times that I've done something like this, I've at least wanted to do it sort of in, in what you would call an online fashion, where you only need to look at one rule at a time uh, and maintain some state and then never look at that rule again. So so say, um, you know, we're, we're told, okay, five through eight, and then we use that rule to update our little database and we say, okay, five through eight are, are busy. And then we get 0 through 2, and we update our database to say, OK, 0 through 2, all right, that doesn't overlap with any of our existing ranges, so add a new range. Uh, and then, oh, 4 through 7, well, all right, now we got to figure out that that overlaps with the 5 through 8 range and collapse them together into one larger range, 4 through 8, and so on, iterating through the data set, looking at each thing only once. Um, and you can do this with uh, a, a, a dictionary or map or what have you uh, that is sorted by uh, <clears throat> by the start time. Uh, you can in you know basically in 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 logarithmic time you can take a new calendar entry, figure out which existing entries, if any, it overlaps with, and coalesce them. Um, so I was trying to do that. And Python, it turns out, just does not have a sorted dictionary. There is no such thing in the standard library. There are, it seems like, a few libraries that provide one for you, you know, external modules. Um, they didn't seem to get much use, judging by, like, how popular they were on Google Hits. One of them was by Apache, and so it's, like, probably pretty good. Um, and, you know, I could have gone and looked you know, downloaded that and added it. But I realized that you don't have to do this in an online fashion. You can you can pre-process all of the data and then work with it. Uh, because we, we don't have like a billion entries in the calendar. It's all small enough to fit into memory. Um, 
and and we know its size and so on and so so um, it turns out now we can look at the code um, it turns out not to be nearly so complicated uh, if you're willing to sort stuff up front so the first thing to do is write a parse function this is pretty straightforward we just have a very simple regex oh I didn't show you the input here this is the input it's just a whole bunch of of, of lines like this and so the first question the first thing to do is say well is there an entry that starts at zero <laughs> like and it turns out yes there is oops uh, Right. There is one entry that starts at zero, so the lowest one is not zero, and then it's kind of like, oh, geez, you know, a little bit harder to um, to you 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 have to actually do the work. You can't just say, oh, the answer is zero. Um, so I I had I didn't commit it, but I had a version of this that didn't work, where my simple algorithm was, okay, let's just sort them all by start date, and then iterate over all of the pairs in the uh, all the pairs of adjacent rules and if the end of one rule is before the start of the next rule then the space in between must be a match must must be uh open um but this is as it turns out incorrect um because you can imagine a rule a series of three rules say like this um zero to nine one to four uh, is that right? Yeah, and then like six to eight. Um, so we would look at zero to nine and say, does one to four leave a space after one to nine? Zero to nine? And the answer is like, no, it doesn't. Okay. And then we say, does six to eight leave a space after one to four? And yeah, it does. Five is open. Uh, but that's obviously wrong because zero through nine blocks five. So you have to be more careful than that. Um, <clears throat> And what I what I came up with is this function called collapse, which takes an iterable of rules uh, and produces an iterable of uh, contiguous ranges. Uh, and it starts it, it 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 keeps track of one uh, range called cur, uh, starting that out as the first rule, and then it says it iterates over the remaining rules. Um, and if the current, I'm reading this now for the first time in like a couple days, so I, I, I'm figuring it out just as I explain it to you guys, what I was doing. Uh, if the if the end, which is cur1, it would have been nicer to use like a class instead of a tuple, but that was a pain, so I didn't. Um, is there any reason? Yeah, it was because it was nice to be able to destructure it. I don't know. Anyway, um, if... Uh, current end plus one is greater than or equal to the start of the next rule, then uh, they overlap, right? So what we do is we just c increase the range that we're tracking, cur, uh, to start at cur sub zero. We know cur sub zero is the first one because they, we sort we sort these by start time uh, down in main before we uh, before we pass them to collapse. So we leave the start of the range alone, and we set the end to be the maximum of the end of the two ranges. Um, and that way we handle overlaps or one rule that completely subsumes another. Is subsumes the I might, I might, I think subsumes is fine there. Um, anyway. So if, if, if the two ranges do overlap, then we just combine them into one larger range that we're thinking of. And if they don't overlap, then we say, okay, well, we found the end of a contiguous range. Uh, so yield it, and then uh, we will set cur to be um, the, 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 the new rule, the one that didn't overlap, and we keep going. So we can, we can yield a series of non-overlapping ranges. Okay, great. Uh, and so what we do, and, and at the end we have to yield the last rule that we were working on because we didn't find any rule to uh, after it. Okay, and so we just uh, we parse all the lines in standard in, and we sort them, and then we collapse them, and we we call next to get out the the lowest range. 
And although I looked at the input and I know that there is a rule that starts at zero, I wanted my program to be correct even in case there is such a rule, even if there is no such rule. Um, so if the low uh, is greater than zero, then we say, oh, zero is the first legal uh, IP. Uh, otherwise, we print one more than the high, high end of the range. Okay, simple enough. And so I won't run this, but if I did, it would work. Um, and uh, so let's look now at part two, which asks a somewhat different question. How many IPs are allowed by the blacklist? Um, but this actually, I don't know, it seems like doesn't ask a lot more, I think. I don't know. How hard was it? Let's find out. Get checkout master. Um, here's part two. So I didn't touch collapse at all. Um, actually, what, what did I do in this commit? So I, yeah, okay. So um, each, basically what I do is after I get the first rule out, I say, all right, well, the number of allowed is, you know, low, which we know is going to be zero, but just in case it wasn't, we um, we say it's you know if the, if the lowest rule starts at four then zero one two and three are all allowed so we set allowed to be low and previous to be high and we basically just iterate over all of the remaining rules um, and uh, what exactly do we do we just say like add the size of the range between the previous range the previous blacklist and this blacklist and we add that to allowed um, there was a little bit of like off by one arithmetic issues to get right but the basic algorithm is pretty simple since we have uh, this collapsed rule set already uh, and this gives us the correct answer of 117 fine now uh, yeah this has been a pretty short episode let's try to get uh, Let's try to get day 20, 21 in here as well. How hard was 21? What was 21? Oh, this one was fun. OK. Um, sure. So uh, hang on. Let's, let's go look at the, at the problem. 21. So I'll let you guys look at this for a moment, scrambled letters and hash, uh, while I do like some Git stuff to figure out uh, how hard it will be to show you guys the history of all this stuff. Usually I do this before the episode, but since we're doing it for two different... Uh, is this interesting? Uh, sure, why not? We'll just show the full history. I hope you guys are enjoying reading this. I don't know, maybe I'll go back and read it for you anyway. Uh, and we'll just say that we want to, hello, Boy, Emacs is slow when I'm recording. Oh, no, that's not going to work. Never mind. <laughs> all right. Forget all this Emacs work. That sounds hard. Um, or all this Git work, I should say. It's easier when it's the most recent problem that I've done or when there's only been one or two commits, but here it took me several commits. So we'll just look over them uh, in a different way. Anyway, so... <clears throat> We're given a password, uh, or rather, we're given a, a, a series of rules for modifying a string. Uh, you can swap the, the, the characters at, at two positions, or you can swap two characters with each other, whatever their positions are, or you can rotate the whole string left or right, or you can rotate uh, based on the position of where a letter is. So that one's the most complicated rule, I think, by far. Well, moves a little complicated. Anyway, so you, you look up what is the index of this character currently, and then you rotate by like that much uh, with this little twist that if that character was at index 4 or greater, i.e. if it was in the right half of the string, then, in, then rotate by one more. Um, you can reverse the letters at a position, uh, and you can move a letter from one position to another, shifting all the stuff in between to uh, make room. And so then the question that we're asked is, suppose that this ABCDEFGH is your password. 
Um, uh, then apply the rules in your input to arrive at um, arrive at a new scrambled password. And so like the input file is a whole bunch of things like this. Definitely too many to do by hand. Um, and let's see. Um, there's got to be... There's got to be a good way to show you guys the progress of my, my git history here. I don't know uh, exactly what it is though. Like, so I can I can get log of the current directory, and you can see like that I made these one, two, three. Well, hang on. You can see that I made these six commits. Um, and I suppose I could just check them each out in sequence. It, there must be a cleaner way to do it. Um, in previous episodes, what I've done is like do an interactive rebase and just mark each one as I want to edit this commit. And then actually I don't edit it, I just continue. Um, but that is hard when I've made changes to other directories outside of this one in the meantime. Um, so, Let's just check out. Let's just check out the first version. Uh, it's pretty long. Um, the parse. Well, let's skip parse for now. So I did this in a similar way to. Remember the one where we had a, an LED display and we had like rotate, or we had like rotate column, rotate row, and like create rectangle, uh, and so we had to track that whole grid. I took the same. I took a similar approach here um, because I think it's easier to do stuff like rotations and reversals if you're not mutating the data structure in place, but rather if you read the data structure, compute a list of changes to make, and then make all those changes. Um, so I defined a few classes, one for each um, kind of move we could do, uh, and for each one, the most important thing is this transform. Indeed, the only interesting method is this transform which takes a string and computes a list of changes that should be made to the string in order to apply the current uh, transformation uh, change in the, the the current rule right so um, swap and f swap and, and rotation take this f parameter which is maybe not yet clear we'll get back to that in a minute but let's look at reversal which is a little more straightforward it takes an x and a y uh, which is, you know, the uh, the range, the first character in the range you need to reverse, and the second character or in the range you need to reverse. So, uh, what? But I replace that with instead of keeping track of y, I keep track of n, which is how many characters to reverse, and that turns out to be a little bit simpler. And so, like, how do you transform? How, uh, how do you how do you apply a reversal? Well, um, for each i in x range of n, so. Um, if we're transforming n characters, we need we need to return n transformations. That's pretty clear. Uh, so we have to do something with i for each item in x range of, of n. Uh, and what we basically just do is, oops, left a space there. I guess let's not try to change it. We're in the middle of git nonsense. Um, we could fix it, but the way we're, we're sort of embroiled in some other stuff at the moment. So, uh, so anyway, we just say the character at n at x, rather, our starting position, plus i, the the index of which character we want to change, is the character to change. And the value to change it to is what was at the string at the offset of, like, I don't know, doing a bunch of this dumb math. I guess it makes sense. x plus n is the right side of the thing. Minus i, minus 1, like, X plus n is one past the right side. If we had saved y, we could just use y. So maybe it would have been better to save x, y, and n, even though they're redundant. Uh, but anyway, we just take, you know, return. We, we say, take the left side of the reversal and set it to what the right side was. And then we move each pointer inward until they you know, you've gotten to both sides of the string. So, uh, you know, that's the idea. Um, and remember, we're not modifying the string in place, so that's fine. 
we're not going to like overwrite stuff. We're returning a list of transformations you could make, and then we have this apply function that actually that actually does that. Uh, so there's no no issue with concurrent traversals. Uh, move is a tricky one. I figuring out how to shift characters. Like I had a lot of trouble with off by ones and so on. And in fact, this version doesn't work. Um, I committed something that was like not right, cause just because it was it was at, it was running, and I was like, "Great, let's let's keep it." Um, but some so there is something interesting that I want to talk about with swap and rotate before we move on to a version that like mostly I think works, um, which is this f parameter. Um, remember that the puzzle has in fact two kinds of swaps: swap a position or swap a letter, and two kinds of rotates rotate uh, by a constant and rotate based on the position of a letter. And I didn't want to create four classes for that. They're very, very similar operations. I said, let's just make one kind of, uh, of swap and we'll pass it a function that it can use to determine the, range, the, the two characters to swap. So <clears throat> if we determine that we're swapping two positions, we create a swap based on a lambda that ignores its argument and just uh, returns the positions uh, in this in the string here. Um, you know, we have to map it, map int and so on, but that's the idea. It just takes the two numbers out of the string. Uh, whereas if we're being asked to swap two letters, uh, then we pass it a lambda that actually looks at the string, and for each of the, the letters, um, you know, group one and group two, it looks up the index in the string that that letter is at and says those are the positions you should swap. Cool. And so if we go look at swap, you can see that it uses that in a pretty simple way. It just saves the function. When it's being asked to transform, it calls the function on s and saves the result saying what two positions should I swap. Uh, and then it just returns this simple two element traversal, not traversal, transformation of set the character at index x to be what was at index y and set the character at y to be what was at index x. Easy. Uh, rotation is pretty similar. Um, we'll get to the function in a second. Let's look at the transformation, assuming the function works. Because uh, all, all, all the function gives you is how much should you shift by, where amount being positive means shift right, amount being negative means shift left. And we basically just take for the entire range of the, of the string, we just take i uh, plus amount uh, modulo the length of the string say that's the new position that you should write the character at this position to and in Python uh, even actually yeah so in some languages uh, negative numbers if you take the modulo of a negative number you get a negative number back there are some reasons why this is more efficient or why in some mathematical contexts it's more convenient. It has to sort of be consistent with how the language uses how the language chooses to do integer division with negative numbers. Um, Python chooses, however, to have like negative one mod four to, to, to be three. Whereas if you did this in Java, negative one mod four would be negative one. I think. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, and those answers are both self-consistent for the language, um, but the way that Python does it tends, is more convenient for working with lists, list indexes anyway. Uh, so it's okay that we can take i, which is zero, and add a number that might be negative, and then modulo the length of the string because it just still works out. Um, and so rotate is a little bit more interesting to par in parsing because that's where we actually write the lambda that does it. Um, if it's just rotating positions, like by a fixed number of steps, uh, then we basically just parse the we parse the uh, second group how how many steps as a number, and we multiply by either one or minus one depending on whether the first group was left or right. Um, rotating based on the position of a letter is more complicated. Uh, in fact, I have a function that I defined called locate which does the job of creating this lambda because it's like too large to write in line, conveniently anyway. And so rotate uh, takes in a letter and returns a function of a string, which uh, applies the rule in the puzzle description of like, 
you know, take the position it's at the in the string, add one, and then if it was greater than four, add one again uh, is the idea. Uh, and so, also, I, I wrote this parse with info function because I was running it, I was debugging it a lot, and these rules are kind of opaque objects, and you can't really tell what they're doing. So I wrote a function that creates a a, a parsed rule object and then attaches the string that was used to create it to that object, so I could debug what's going on. Uh, and then in update password, I actually ran that right. Um, so we can we can in fact. We can run it, and it says like, okay, here's the progress of the string, and here's all the rules I'm applying, and like what I get to. And I believe in this version, the first error crops up probably from here to here. Yeah. Mm, no, this actually looks fine. Oh yeah, move three to two, that's the A. Swap it with the D, that's fine. Move six to five also, I believe, works from here to here. Mm, yeah, it swaps the G and the H. But I had a problem with um, moving letters that were not adjacent to each other, I think. I don't remember exactly, because this was not the answer, was it? My puzzle answer was D, F, no, my puzzle answer is, my real answer is D, B, F, G, A, E, H, C, which does not, like, look at all close to what we've written here, right? Um, I think the problem was with moves, but, uh, but uh, I'm not sure. So, at any rate, um, what, what did we do next? Next, we've fixed a broken move implementation, uh, which is, oh yeah, I didn't look at the implementation of move, it was kind of hairy. Uh, yeah, I had some issues where, like, if one of them was, the way I was handling one number being larger than the other, uh, handling a change been whether x is larger or y is larger, I was doing that incorrectly. Um, And honestly, like the details of how this works, I don't know. I don't think it's that interesting to talk about. It was kind of hard, but it's all just like kind of fiddly off by one arithmetic stuff that is just not that interesting. Um, the kind of thing that you just sort of play with in a, in a REPL until it finally works and then you forget you ever looked at it. Uh, what's next? What did we do next? That, that got us, I believe, a... Um, Ah, yes. That got us a working solution for part one. So let's look now at part two, which is, I think, pretty hard. Well, let me take that back. It's interesting. Uh, it turns out you can't actually use the result of scrambling a password. What you need to do is unscramble a password. Um, so they give us this password and say, all right, undo it. Um, and... So why don't you guys take a moment, if you like, to think about uh, how you would solve this. You know, just like a general idea of what the algorithm would be. Not, not write it in any detail, but, um, you know, pause the video if you like, think about it, and then, uh, I'll, and then, and then unpause when you have an idea. Okay, great. So the reason that I wanted to give you guys a moment to think about it is because uh, in a lot of things in life, and you know, in software as well, uh, it's easy to not think so hard about the requirement, like what you actually need to to have a goal, and then come up with one way to get to that goal and just be stuck to it forever, even if it's not... E Oops, sorry about that noise. Uh, even if it's not, like, the best way to get there, you, you get so focused on, like, uh, the path that you forget that the idea is to get to the goal. 
Um, and so uh, I, I did that for this problem. And I said, well, okay, how do you figure out, how do you reverse rules, is what I said, right? Um, because that's a cool problem, and it'll get us to the answer. Uh, we, we, we take the rules in the password list, and uh, we apply them in reverse, and then we get an answer. Great. Um, and so let me, in fact, show you how that worked. So, whoops. What I did is I added. Hello? Is this the right? Uh, I guess not. Oh, I checked out the wrong version. Uh, da, 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 this one, please. Ah, come back. OK, here we go. So, oh, geez, rotation is a spoiler already. Look how long it is. I implemented for each uh, each of these classes an undo function. Um, so, like, how do you undo a swap? Well, it's easy. You just do the swap again. Uh, we'll skip rotation for the moment. How about a reversal? Well, uh, you again, if you to undo reversing the characters A through Z, you can just reverse the characters A through Z. Same. No problem. Uh, and so these sort of easy ones were sort of... Uh, providing confirmation to me saying, yeah, you're doing it right, you're getting there. Um, undoing a move is very similar, very simple, right? To undo moving x to y, you just move y to x. Um, and all that leaves us is rotations, which is like sort of pretty simple, right? To undo rotating by 5, just rotate by minus 5. But there's a problem which is this one little rule uh, about rotating by the location of a letter. Uh, it's kind of hard to, to do that, right? To, to look at a string and say, all right, I need to rotate based on the position of letter D. D is now at seven. Where was it before the rotation? Um, and it seemed to me like there must be some closed form way to do that. Uh, but even if I could figure that out, the way that I structured the problem, um, the, the way that I structured my data structure made it hard to even apply a closed form uh, version because I based rotations on this lambda, which is this opaque thing that you can't easily look into. I guess in Python you can actually introspect the closed over variables in a lambda, but that's just dumb. Don't do that. Uh, it just, it's not very helpful. Like, in this instance, it's dumb. I, I understand there may be some reasons to do that, although personally, I think that such things are evidence that like you built your lambda wrong. If you need to look at what things it closed over, like probably it should have been a class object with fields instead uh, and a method. So we could have done that. We could have made rotation into like two classes, one with, with different fields, and then uh, And then figured out how to apply the closed form solution for like based on where it is, where should it be, where where was it? Um, but I wasn't even really sure what that closed form solution is, so it seemed like the wrong direction to go in to push my solution in that direction. And instead, what I did is I said, okay, well you know what? There's only eight possible ways you could rotate the string. Let's just try all of them, and see which ones. Uh, which, which one ends up with the actual string that we wanted to get from? And then we'll say, okay, that's the change you should make, is one that gets you back to that. Um, so this is, I think, a pretty bad method. Um, it it breaks, like, rules of abstraction. Like, we, we have this, this transform function, the whole point, and undo, which is supposed to be, like, the same thing, is that it doesn't need to know about how to actually modify a string. It just says, here's the rules you should apply to change the string. It doesn't need to actually take a string and set characters in it, right? But in order to try speculatively rotating, so what I do is I just iterate through all the, the numbers from like one to the, zero to the length of the string, and I say like, okay, try rotating by this much. And in order to try rotating, I need to use apply, which is this function 
that is supposed to be the one calling undo or transform. We're not supposed to be calling it. This is like breaking the rules of you know how this program is supposed to have been structured. Um, but you know it should work, right? Um, and I ran into some trouble because a number of my implementations of undo were a little bit janky and that didn't quite work. And I said, all right, let's try this on a simple test case, the uh, example input here, right? Where they say, um, where's our, they, they give us just a five letter string and eight rules instead of an eight character string, like a trillion rules, right? That'll be easier to debug, I said. Um, and I was just having a heck of a time getting the rotations right. Um, and the main issue was the very second rule. So we were able to turn decab into uh, ecadb, I think, relatively successfully. No, no, I, I don't remember if it was, I don't remember, one of these two, these last two trans transformations was real hard. I, I kept getting it wrong, I don't remember which. Um, and uh, so I was like, I was getting frustrated, and so I just committed what I had and said, does the trans transformations or rotations don't work. Uh, oh, actually, let's look real quick at how we use undo. It's not very difficult. Um, in, we just have a function like update password that's called crack password and it uses undo instead of uh, transform. So this is like superbly, that's the wrong word, let's just say very. It's very repetitive. I would much prefer to factor some of this stuff out, but like, I don't know, in Python sort of dis discourages stuff like that by making lambdas kind of awkward and like you have to create a lambda that takes in a rule and a string and calls rule dot like it wouldn't be too awful you could do it you could make these two uh, argument these two functions into one function that takes a lambda as an argument and it wouldn't be too bad but I didn't uh, okay so at any rate we had some issues uh, and we tried that uh, we, we committed a thing. And you see my next commit here. You're looking at my commits, right? No. Ha ha ha. Okay. Knew I, I had to get it wrong eventually. Okay, so I was just I was just telling you guys that uh, I have this function in crack password, and it looks a lot like update password, right? The only difference is uh, this. Um, and you could factor it out, but I didn't. And I blame Python even though I don't think that's fair. <laughs> it's really just me. Okay, so anyway, I, my next commit was <laughs> LOLJK part 21 was already working. Uh, it turns out that for five character strings, rotating based on the position of a letter is not necessarily a one-to-one uh, -a -one mapping. There can be mul two different original strings can yield the same transformed strings. There's no unique unwrapping. Um, but for eight character strings, our real inputs, um, it, it, it is unique. That's why this like add one if it's greater than four thing is there is, I think, so that it becomes unique. Uh, so my next commit was to just like leave everything the same, but actually run it on the real input and then it's fine. So the problem was that I got, I had some trouble while I was writing this commit, uh, here here, and I decided to simplify by, while the problem was still broken, the, the I'm sorry, the, the program was still broken, I simplified by running it on a simpler input. But that caused me to not notice when I had finished fixing the problem, because it turns out I was debugging an impossible problem. Um, and then I have a couple more just clean up commits. Uh, we'll, we'll look at those briefly, I suppose. So here I, I, I add a comment to apologize for how gross it is that undo uh, needs to rely on apply. Um, and I remove this debug printing of like how the progress of this of cracking the password is going. And you can see that my last commit is just to like 
replace the, the, the test inputs with the real input and it's fine. Uh, okay, so that's cool. It all works eventually. But um, what is all this I was saying earlier about being easy to, to focus on the wrong way to solve a problem because it seems fun and interesting? Um, after I did all this, I was reading on the subreddit about you know someone else's solution and how they got there quickly. And they said, look, there's eight characters. How many ways are there to scramble an eight character password? There's eight factorial, which is like, I don't know, a few hundred thousand or something. Not that many. Um, and so he said, uh, just try every single possible original password, run them through your transform, and the first one that gives you the scrambled version that you wanted, that's the answer. And that's so easy. It doesn't involve any of this nonsense. It's much less elegant, and it doesn't scale to uh, very, very large password spaces. Like if we had, say, 30 character passwords, I think our approach would be better. Uh, Especially if we worked out like how to do the, the rotations uh, as sort of a closed form thing. Um, which you could do. You could like, for example, even by hand, figure out, you know, based on... If, if the character you're looking at is in position 7, then it must have been shifted by 4, or whatever the rule is. I don't know. Probably that's wrong. Um, and just apply those rules. Uh, you could unscramble a password in, in very, very fast uh, time linear in like the length of the number of rules rather than being factorial in the size of the password. But since the size of the password is small enough, factorial in the size of the password was fine, uh, and you could actually do this very quickly and easily if you wanted. And I just didn't even imagine uh, a brute force solution, even though a lot of the stuff in Advent of Code, brute force is a great way to do stuff. I saw a clever way to do it, and I said, that's it. That's what I gotta do. The clever thing. Um, and I don't exactly hate having made that choice, you know. I'm not doing Advent of Code to get the answers, right? None of these are, I'm not getting, you know, a paycheck every time I solve a problem. And I don't care about the leaderboard stuff. Um, I'm doing it to be good at solving, you know, writing programs in Python. And I think that, you know, maybe just writing another brute force solver is less useful to me than uh, writing this clever in quotes, uh, rule reverser. Um, but it also would have been nice to have realized, hey, I actually could just brute force this and then like decide whether to do that or not rather than miss the easy solution and do the hard one instead. So I don't know, that's like a lesson I think is to try to pay more attention to possible solutions that are, don't, don't be led down this path of like, the problem is telling me to do things in reverse. Let's do them in reverse. Figure out a good way from the start to the end. Uh, figure out which way you want to go best rather than just the, the, the one that seems most obvious. Anyway, uh, so that's it for this episode. As you guys noticed, uh, if you looked at my advent calendar, we do have a couple more days to go that I've already solved and I need to record a video for. But uh, we won't do that in this episode. It's a uh, already plenty long. Uh, so I hope you guys have enjoyed. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.